Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the four card of fights for UFC 276, Adesanya versus Cannonier. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the card that I'll be predicting. Well, the first fight on the card in general, but anyway, first fight on the card we got in the women's bantamweight division. Jessica Rose Clark versus Julija Stoliarenko. And how I feel about this one is I feel like Clark is one of those fighters that um even if she doesn't need to, she always feels the need to take the fight to the ground. And I feel like along with, you know, not really being on the best streak right now. Well, Lori Rinko ain't on a streak at all right now. All of it. Well, a positive one at all. Like, she's like on a four or five fight losing streak. And she ain't win a fight in the UFC, so that's a worse streak. But I don't know. I don't like the fact that Rose Clark got a boob job, which is not really a super relevant. Well, matter of fact, it is kind of a relevant factor given that most women, once they get the boob jobs, they really start to dip off and... Go to OnlyFans or Celebrity Kick. I say Celebrity Kickbox, but <laughs> Bare Knuckle Boxing or something like that. They just dip off. So, I don't know. It's a dip effect. But the fact that she um likes to wrestle so much, the fact she's come off with armbar laws, you know, got concerns for me because that's what Stoli Wrinkle likes to do. She's a armbar specialist, a slot fest. Neither have been the best striker. I think in a case where Rose Clark is just too willing to grapple. Yeah, far too willing to grapple. Sloppy striking on both ends. But Stoli Rinko been a, a more aggressive, wanting it more, forcing the action more. And Rose Clark gets caught, like, you know, gets a sloppy, or not the cleanest takedown, ends up in a scramble, or doesn't end up in a position where her arms are already trapped, and Stoli Rinko is able to snatch the arm bar up, I feel like, second round. So in this fight, I got Julija Stoli Rinko via second round submission. Now to our next fight, we have in the women's flyweight division, Jessica I versus Macy Barber. And how I feel about this one is, I feel like it's going to be a tight matchup. I feel like Jessica I is clearly, uh, clearly the better striker, very much smoother with her striking. But Barber is much younger. I feel much hungrier. And I feel like she's going to try to use her size to muscle this guy against the cage, try to control her at times. I feel like this guy's going to do well to respond, land shots. I feel like it's going to be a very tight matchup that's going to be left to the judges' discretion. And the judges, you know how they judge. Like, they they kind of iffy. So this is a fight where, you know, definitely flip a coin. And definitely could be a case where it could be a tight, like a split decision or a majority decision type fight. But either way, a very close fight, I feel. I just don't feel like either fighter has a true edge as much as they would want or would need in this one to make it a clear pick. But I feel like the judge is going to favor the younger fighter. They're going to favor the positional control. And they're going to favor the heavier shots. And, um, yeah, Macy Barber's going to win, like, a tight matchup, probably trying to bully um the smaller just guy against the cage, the smaller, older just guy against the cage, land some shots, land some heavy shots at distance and mid-range. You know, really, when they strike, striking, I feel like Barber's going to be missing a lot. But when she does land, she's going to land pretty heavy and going to look aggressive, look the part of an aggressive fighter. And, like, you know, she might not be landing. She might be landing on the arms or the shoulders or something. But it's going to be heavy, so just going to be receptive of that as well, so. Tight matchup. Judges lean to the youth, lean to the power, lean to the aggression, lean to the control. So in this fight, I got Macy Barber via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the middleweight division, Uriah Hall versus Andre Muniz. And how I feel about this one is, I feel like Uriah Hall is a solid fighter, but grappling has always been an issue of his. And he's like 37, 38. He's pushing up there. Muniz is like in the early 30s. Bigger, younger, Solid BJJ. I worry about his striking. I worry about how he can react to striking. I worry about some, a little bit about his cardio, but I feel like he's in a very good spot. Momentum's on his side, and, but you know, you, you never know what you're out. You're out is just that guy that's that wild card. He can just about beat anyone on a good night and just about lose to anyone on a bad night. This guy, you could kind of say, he is truly a middleweight Michael Johnson. You know, some of you might say, oh, this guy's a Michael Johnson. This guy's a lightweight Michael but you're out for like fits in that category very well because wrestling issues, Explosive, very fast, um, one of the better strikers in the weight class, but very inconsistent in similar issues. But his submission defense ain't as bad. He don't turn into a fish a lot of times when he in these grappling situations, but still. And the one's back and not being able to do much. But then, yeah, gives me a lot like the younger fighter to, you know, try struggle with the takedown early in the first round. But eventually get it, we're on him in the first round, probably land some heavy ground to pound and sink, look for the choke, not able to get it. And then second round, able to find it easier after having a worn out haul from, you know, carrying him in a, really like probably half of that first round and defending some submission attempts or just holding his weight and taking ground to pound. Then the second round, easier takedown, you got a tired fighter. 
get him to the like, cage, get a hold of him, drag him down, pound him, get him to respond, turn over, take his back, let him ground a pound, heavy hips, flatten him out, more ground a pound, then slip their rear naked choke under, tap him out second round. So in this fight, I got Andre Muniz via second round submission. Now to our next fight, we have in the middleweight division, Brad Tavares versus Drickus Duplacis or Duplacis. I feel about this one is both of these guys definitely got flaws, but I feel like momentum is definitely on Duplacis' side as far as my opinion goes. I feel like Duplacis is going to come up, and I feel like he's going to have that come up success for a good little while now. I'm not saying he's going to go and be no stuff. I feel like he got definitely got some big flaws as far as like when when pressed, he kind of ducks his head down and leaves himself open. So. He definitely got his own flaws. But I feel like Tavares got his own flaws as well. And Tavares has made, been made to pay more for it. You know, he has been running UFC longer. It's been taped. It's been televised. So um, I think what Tavares is going to do, I feel like he'll come out early. I feel like he'll be the cleaner striker. I think Duplacy is a pretty slow starter. But it's not like Tavares is such a great finisher necessarily. But again, I'm, but, I'm saying again. But what I feel is the, the lock pick for this fight is a prop. Fight doesn't go the distance because I feel like on odd then it's going to be stopping for Tavares, so it's going to be stopping for Duplacis. Tavares might have had some fights that go to the decision, but that's more so when we going with a guy that's just trying to jock hold, like hold his jock strap. And then he just used his legendary takedown defense to keep it on the, fight, on the feet and just probably just box them up. Striking matches, I feel like it's like really finish or be finished outside of the Adesanya fight. So, but anywho, I feel like with this one, Tavares will come out. I feel like he's overall the more polished striker, at least early. But I think he has a tendency to get caught up in the fight and then leave his hand, like, his chin up. And Tavares, I mean, I said, yeah, Tavares has that tendency. He plays, he has a tendency to find that moment when his opponent is kind of being lax out there, you know, kind of sitting in range. Like, they feel like they're sitting out of range, but they're sitting right at the end of range. The place has a habit of finding that hook on his opponent as they lay it back then. Like I said, Tavares has a history of getting caught with that, and the place has a history of landing that. And I feel like that's what's going to be the case. I feel like it's going to be a good first round for Tavares. Still probably be a competitive fight either way, but a good first round of ours that people like, yeah, he won that round. Not looking the best for two places. In the second round, they start to get a little bit more closer. The place probably touch him a little bit early in the round. You know, just give something to Tavares to think about. Touch him, give him something to fill on. But then um fight continues playing out. And the place see that same opportunity again. Doesn't miss it. Connects heavy, drops him, follow up ground and pound, second round TKL. So in this fight, I got Drickus two places via second round TKL. Now to our next fight, we have in the welterweight division, Ian Gary versus Gabe Green. And how I feel about this one is, I feel like Gabe Green has, you know, some of the skill set, but I don't feel like he has the full package to beat Ian Gary. And right now, I just feel like Ian Gary has a lot of momentum on his side. I feel like with Gabe Green, I feel like he'll bring the pressure, but he only really has the offensive grappling. I feel like Gary's the better grappler. Well, not, I'm sorry, better grappler. Better wrestler. Gabe Green's definitely the better grappler, like submission grappler. But Gary's, I feel like, the better wrestler, if you get my drive. At least offensively, defensively, and statistically. Gabe Green, wrestling defense is very questionable, but his BJJ is not questionable. I feel like, like Ian Gary's length, I like his overall technical striking. I feel like Gabe Green will try to get in a lot of time to walk into counters and put the, push the volume. I feel like Gary would do a good job to respond, good job to keep him at distance. But Gabe Green will, like, he will keep him active. But again, I just don't feel like Gabe Green going to have the full pack to be a close fight, very close fight. But I just don't feel like Gabe Green will have the overall pack. I don't feel like he has the necessary power. And obviously, I feel like wrestling isn't where it needs to be. Jiu-Jitsu is there. But also, I don't feel like Gary's going to be one of those guys like, you know, his last opponent who's going to necessarily fade. Like a young guy with decent cardio and like pretty decent cardio and put decent pace and measured. He now did his swinging haymakers and going to get blows wide and not all day just overspin him. So he, he can push a good pace, but he's always monitored. Like he's always measured. He's a very measured fighter, is what I'm going to say. Defensively, I see a lot of flaws, but I don't see Gabe Green necessarily having that big opportunity or that such a good case to really um, work on that or to take advantage of that. So, yeah, Gabe Green could at least probably show it to some other guy, but I feel like Gabe Green is not the guy to to stop Gary just yet. So, in this fight, I have Ian Gary via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the welterweight division, Jim Miller. Well, Dan, I said Dan, but Donald Cerrone versus Jim Miller in the welterweight division. And how I see this fight right here is um, they fought before. Donald Cerrone absolutely destroyed, decimated Jim Miller. But that's just not the reason why I'm only picking Donald Cerrone. I feel like Jim Miller has been getting sliced up, or at least 
Cerrone's getting sized up. Well, both of these guys are getting sized up one way. Cerrone getting sized down because, oh, he got, he's on a bad streak of losses. Jamila getting sized, oh, and also because he, he got to cut weight twice, but this at 70, not 55. If he had to cut to 55 two times, I feel like that would have been a stronger case for the fact, oh, Cerrone looked bad at 55 kind of weight, and now he got to cut weight like a week later or two weeks later. But he's going from 55 to 70, so that's like 50 pounds, 15 pounds less to cut. And I feel like he's going to just balloon up, especially knowing that he had to do it again. So I feel like he's already right, probably right around 170, so he probably only got to cut so much pounds. So I don't feel like that's going to be a certain matter of fact. He probably be fresher or, you know, might be even a good thing or something, a relief off his, off his shoulder. But who knows? I definitely don't think it's a bad thing. Whether it's a good or a bad thing, I don't think it's going to be either. But I definitely don't think it's good. I don't think it's bad, but I don't think it really means too much. Jamila on the other side. Yeah, Jamila been beating tomato cans. Like absolute tomato cans. And Dos Morano been fighting the best of the best. Alex Morano was probably the lowest person he lost to, but Morano will decimate J current Jim Miller as well, I feel. So it is what it is. But anywho, MMA and math aside, I feel like Cerrone still matches up pretty well with Miller, and I don't think he's his shot. That's all I'm saying. He's longer, he's taller. I feel like he's a cleaner striker. I feel like he got worried about the big shots early from Jim Miller. But I feel like he should be fine with that. I feel like he should be able to intercept those hooks, those overhands with stepping knees and dig right into um, Jim Miller's um, body, dig right into Miller's chin. It uses distance, tear up the legs of Jim Miller. I feel like Jim Miller responded well. He got some decent calf kicks as well, but good responses. But um, they get a little fill-out process through the first round, probably a little bit of a middle round, maybe. Also, I feel like Ronnie could has a, a good chance to wrestle Jim Miller as well. He got solid BJJ as well, does Cerrone. And I know he can avoid the guillotines of Jim Miller. And just be able to take him down, just like um, Diego Sanchez did sometimes ago, and just take him down and control him and shut down his jiu-jitsu. So Ronnie definitely has the skills to do that and the wrestling to do that and has done that against some pretty high-level guys as well, people forget. But, yeah, it's like Cerrone all overall in this one. But tight um, first round, maybe lean to Miller, but I think second round, not the same Miller out there. And then Cerrone really starts to turn it up, really start to dig to him, start to, you know, start to look a little bit vintage and put it on um, Jim Miller, and then put Jim Miller away in that second round. So in this fight, I got Donald Cerrone via second round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the lightweight division, Brad Riddell versus Jalen Turner. And how I feel about this one, I like Jalen Turner's height. I like his reach. I like his recent streak of performances. Riddell's um, wrestling is a big concern for me. His striking background is a big concern for me. But I feel like Jalen Turner is hot right now. He's getting to his group. He's evolving into... Um, the fighter that you know everyone knew he could be, and the potential is really coming there. The the expert would have to like the um, he's meeting the potential now. He's beginning to meet the potential. That's what I'm trying to say. But I feel about this one, I feel like it's gonna be a pretty tight matchup. But actually looking for leading to a spectacular for turn. I feel like Riddell's gonna come out good feeling process, good judge of range, making the long Jay Turner miss a little bit. Probably going for some couple takedowns. Looking decent first off, but then James Turner start to respond well. Probably, you know, give up a, a takedown early, but be to respond, get up well, and, like, you know, set the tone that I ain't going to get taken down and you're going to try to put on a endurance wrestling clinic on me or endurance pace-pushing style on me that, you know, Riddell was able to do. Be to neutralize the takedown. You probably get back up, land some heavy knees, some elbows, get Riddell off him. It starts, once he gets that out of the way, you know, confidence going to start to rise and start to push um. The pace, I just slap teeps into um, Riddell's body. And then had Riddell probably biting on the teep, then landing straight shots down the middle, using that height, using that reach. Then Riddell tried to close, stuff to take down, land some elbows. And just had Riddell not really been to find a way out. And then really start to touch up more clean shots. Had Riddell, you know, reactive shooting. Reactive shoots right into a sprawl, to a guillotine. Some more knees. Then commit to the take the submission and tap Riddell out in the very first round. So in this fight, I got Jalen Turner via first-round submission. Now to our main card, we have in our first fight in the Bantamweight division, Pedro Munoz versus John O'Malley. And I feel about this fight between Munoz versus O'Malley is, I think um this is Sean O'Malley's fight to win. I feel like Munoz has, really it's just come down to his toughness, his power, and his kicks. I mean, he has the skills and all that stuff, but I feel like Sean O'Malley, if you, you take away Sean O'Malley's um, Mr. Glass body, this is Sean O'Malley's fight all day. Maybe he could own just a little bit, but Sean O'Malley has pretty solid take on things. It really is coming down to his fragility. And we're not just talking about the, um, we're not just talking about the Cheeto Vera fight. Well, I'm not just talking about the Cheeto Vera fight. I remember his fight against Andre Sukumtov. 
And when he was doing such a great performance, then his, his body broke on him again. And that, or his, fight, his body broke on him the first time. And then later on, the Cheeto Vera fight, body broke on him again, you know, but with, with the help of Cheeto Vera. The first with um, Sukumtao, I think that was purely himself just breaking because he made out of, he don't got milk bones. He got um, soy bones or something. But something ain't right with this man, basically. But um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like in this fight, Sean O'Malley's going to use, he's just too fast, too long. Pedro Munoz got T-Rex arms. And his game plan going to be too, tele, too um, typical. I don't feel like I have any sense with his wrestling. I feel like he'll be missing on these big power shots, trying to pressure, just walking the shots, getting tagged up, getting teed up, trying to those kicks. I feel like he's gonna be, Sean O'Malley's going to throw some kicks. Probably He's going to be um, very measured with them, limit the kicks to the leg, probably try to slam some to the body. Then just really turn into a boxing match, use that height, use that reach, use that speed. It really just hit Munoz. Munoz really ain't got the best head when he got a very big head, so it's hard to move that big head. And he got little baby arms and baby legs. He's going to wish the longest Sean O'Malley, who's just faster, younger, sharper. I feel like he's going to just get beginning you know, hit with long combinations, get hit with clean counters. And Sean O'Malley's going to be able to load up at times and put some, you know, sting on Pedro Munoz. And Pedro Munoz ain't really going to have the best response to it or the best reactions to it. Or he's not going to have really the best options to do anything in that one. He's going to be very limited and really just trying to feel for where O'Malley's on or trying to force something and just getting tagged up. I feel like he's going to do, do what no one has done before in the UFC and put um, Munoz away. I feel like he puts a strike on Munoz, and I feel like he, he puts him up in the second round. So in this fight, I got Sean O'Malley via second round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the welterweight division, Robbie Lawler versus Brian Barberina in the welterweight division, if I didn't already say it. How I feel about this one is, I feel like Brian Barberina, he just ain't, he just not that guy. He's a solid fighter, solid competitor. But he's just more so an annoying, volume punching brawler. That's a brawler with not the heaviest hands in most cases, but those a lot of values. But who knows? He's going in with an older Robbie Lawler, so it's definitely a fight that probably should go his way, probably. But I'm believing Robbie Lawler. I just felt like I didn't like the best performer. I didn't like. I mean, I haven't really been liking what I've seen from Brian Barbarino over his past couple fights. We lost to that um mediocre wrestler, the guy, not too long ago. Struggled with um, Matt Brown. Not to say Matt Brown's a bad fighter, but at that age, he should have been able to walk over him a little bit. As a matter of fact, it should have been no split decision. It was a very tight matchup. That really could have went either way. But anyway, I feel like Robbie Lawler is going to be able to roll with the shots, actually sit in with some effective shots, get a rip into the body, that soft body of his, land some knees. But it's going to be a tight matchup. It's going to be probably coming out to what the judges want to see. I'm going to say he's going to stop it. Robbie Lawler is going to stop him. Brian Barbarin doing a lot of volume, but not too much. Actual substance, but the judge is going to be eating it up. But Robbie Law going to be rolling with the shots, walking him down, land some body shots, or or let him do his get a little offense off, and then fire back with some clean counters, start to dig into his body, slam some heavy kicks into his body, cross takedowns, then really start to land heavy on him. Once he starts to get his timing down, and Brian Breen starts to slow down, like again, dig into that body, Brian Brown starts to get tired, start to mouth breathe. Power starts, the sting starts to come off his punches. The output starts to drop a little bit. Then Rob Law starts to land shots in the clinch, put some plump, to put the plum on him, land some knees to the body, land some elbows. Probably have him breathing heavy, ducking him from shots, land a flying knee, hurt him a bit, push him to the cage, land some more shots. Then they get like the third round. It's a very tight matchup. Brian Barrena like, starts to slow down, mouth breathe even more, starts to avert, you know, punch averse and strike aversion, starts to circle away the, uh, like, you know, kind of walk. It's not really even, like, a effective circle, but, like, you know, he's walking, you crossing your feet, trying to circle off the cage. And now I think Robbie Law starts to rip him to the body as he tries to exit to the to the sides, rip him to the body, follow him, crunch him over, shots, plumb again, knees, elbows, curls Barbarina against the cage, ground to pound, gets him out of there third round. So in this fight, I got Robbie Lawler via third round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the middleweight division, Sean Strickland versus Alex Pereira or Pajeda. I'm going to say Pereira. And how I feel about this one is, I just think um, I'm going Pereira here. Now he's the underdog currently. Um, Sean Strickland, um, as far as I feel, I just feel like he's one of those fighters. He historically always knew he didn't have the best wrestling, historically, and admittedly several times. And I feel like he's working on it, but I still don't think it's quite there in the proof as it needs to be. I feel like he doesn't have a good BJJ game, but I'm not really feeling like it's such a phenomenal BJJ game. He's a solid BJJ guy. Definitely, definitely, definitely solid. He's definitely skilled, but I'm going based off effectiveness. I don't feel like it's effectively where it needs to be. I feel like it'd be a case where he really breaks Pereira down, just wears him down in the striking and clinching him up, 
And then they're able to really have success with the takedowns, then the jujitsu. But initially on, I'm feeling he's going to have the greatest success with any takedowns or any submission grappling. But in, ultimately, I don't feel he's going to win. I'm going with Rivera here. I just feel like Strickland's not going to have the success he wants in, in um, grappling. He's going to try to. He might have limited, but not to the degree he needs. And I feel like fight most likely going to, I said most likely, but mostly he's going to play out on the feet. And I think in that striking match, Pereira's going to be able to take advantage of Strickland's game more than Strickland's able to take advantage of Pereira's game. I think Pereira's going to take advantage of that shoulder roll, take advantage of that sideways stance. He's going to be able to, you know, in his defensive um, techniques with his turning, probably be able to turn him right into hooks, turn him to body, hooks to the body, turn him to hooks up top, land kicks up top. Um, Strickland likes to keep the hand pretty low, so I feel like he'd be able to touch with some kicks up top, touch some, slam some kicks to the body, kicks to the inner, the inner leg. Is really just take advantage of Strickland stand. Like Strickland stands very upright, very flat footed, and it's not like he's the most. He's not great at checking leg kicks at all. Like he really don't check kicks. He stands very straight up, very flat footed, and does arm punches. Pereira does with heat. Strickland's pretty open to the hooks. Especially when he like it's not telegraph and sh- Pereira can throw that hook like a, with a snap, like he can throw it, just sneak that hook in there very fast, and that's like really his bread and butter. So I feel like he'll be cut Strickland with some good hooks at times, and the slam kicks in the leg, slam kicks in the body. And I think it's like there's a breakdown effect over the course of three rounds, like probably two tight rounds, but then eventually that damage starts to accumulate on Strickland. He's not able to plant like he is, probably switching stances. Probably look a little bit off balance and just trying to, you know, it get, it get a little bit sloppy out there. And the more he gets sloppy, the more it breaks down, the more things open up. And I think Strickland's, I mean, prayer is basically to find a hook real hard on him. His hands start to drop, especially from getting slammed with kicks to the body. Now he starts reacting like he, a kick is coming. Hands come extended. Gets caught with a hook. Wobbled. Forever just turns it up on him. Shots to the body, shots up top, flying knees, and just swarming on him and puts him away in that third round. So in this fight, I have Alex Pereira. Via third round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in our co-main event in the featherweight division, Alexander Volkanovski versus Max Holloway for the undisputed featherweight title. Volkanovski versus Holloway three. Volk is up two to zero. Holloway's down 0-2. Half of us one. Holloway had looked amazing in the um, Qatar fight. Looked amazing in the, in the Ortega fight, but obviously not Ortega, but um, he did look amazing in the Ortega fight. Way more than amazing than Volkanovski, but that's a different thing. That's different years and such. But recently looked good in the Yair fight as well, but. It was a very close fight and very competitive and it was supposed to be a dominant performance from him, whereas Volkanovski has had two dominant performances over his last two opponents. Though they weren't deserving of title shots, he looked amazing against both of those guys. But anyway, nonetheless, I feel like this fight is most likely going to go with Volkanovski way, but it's probably, I feel for sure the lock is probably a decision. These both of these guys are so solid, so competitive. Holloway don't get stopped. Volkanovski don't quit. Only Holloway you've ever been even dropped, so... It's not like his submission game is weak or his ground, like his ground game. His ground game used to be real weak, but he worked hard on that. His ground game has become actually a strength. I feel like if he actually snuck in some wrestling here, that's a good edge for him to maybe get over and get a decision or even work to get a stoppage or, you know, give Volkanovski a different look. He definitely could do it. It's not like Volkanovski has no great submission game. So there's no real, and also Hollywood got great cardio, so no real reason why he should not or be averted, like averted. There should be any aversion or reason to, feel like he shouldn't mix in his grappling. I'm not saying that should be his main focus, but to throw in there at times or just throw a couple looks, maybe three takedown attempts in a fight could definitely change it. Like, obviously, it ain't worked two times. I mean, your strategy or whatever, like, whatever strategy you did have those first two times ain't worked. So try something new. I feel like he didn't really ever, hasn't really tried to grapple or mix in, in any grapple. I'm not saying his approach should be to grapple, but his approach has never really included grappling. I feel like he can. His wrestling offense and defense is very underrated. So there's opportunities there. But, um... Especially with Volkanovski not expecting it. But anywho, I feel like this fight is going to be close. Whether Holloway has amazing first round or Volk has amazing first round, I feel like ultimately, or amazing first rounds or the first couple rounds, I feel like ultimately this fight has a rhythm and it's going to fall back in the same rhythm. And with Volkanovski checking those inside, checking those, the jab with the inside leg kick, catching with shots over the top, and Holloway just keep rushing in and already just keep trying to land shots and get aggressive. It's going back to the jab and that jab keep getting countered several which ways. Like, like, how are we going to go back to that jab and, like, get jab happy? And Volkanovski already got the timing on it, the answer for it, and multiple answers for that same question. So, be chewing the leg up, chewing the inside leg up, countering it with inside kicks, counter with overhands, mixing the outside leg kicks, switching stance, and Holloway just, you know, been a couple steps behind. Like, he's throwing the volume up there, but he's getting hit too clean. 
and having that most shots taken. He has the most shots landed, but he has the most shots taken in the world. It's going to get some more shots added to that. Once again, a very close fight. And again, low confidence because this fight is so close. And with the judges, they could the judge however they wanted to be. It could play out the same exact way it always plays out. And the judges would be like, hmm, this week we're going to be different. We're going to give it to Holloway. So, and even in uh, these other cases, like whatever would be the second or first fight, if they were leaning to Holloway, it would have not been a robbery. Especially the second fight. It would not have been a robbery. So, similar close fight. Judges could be on BS, but if they probably, with their usual thing, it's probably going to play out the same exact, same exact pattern. And I feel like Volkanovski is going to win again at yet another close decision. Like, it's a fight that's always play out. Obviously, different things going to happen, but I felt same, similar outcome, similar path, uh, pattern. Similar outcome, similar pattern. So, in this fight, I got Volkanovski, well, Alexander Volkanovski via decision. Now to our main event, we have in the middleweight division for the undisputed middleweight title, Israel Adesanya versus Jared Cannonier. And how I feel about this one is, I just think, um, I don't really see no real path to victory for Cannonier. He always got power, and that's about it. He can touch Adesanya and maybe hurt him to a decision, which I'm not really banking on, or put his lights out. That's really his best opportunity, and I'm not banking on that either. I just feel like Adesanya is bigger, longer, younger, far more talented, far more technical, and Cannonier is going to play him in this game. You go in there, is a... MMA strike with some power versus a world-class, legit kickboxing world champion with hundreds of fights over multiple different combat sports. And you're just coming with one dimension. Yeah, I just feel like Adesanya is going to just pick him apart, use his length, use his reach, use his technique, be a Dolly's face out, make him their miss, make him pay, and just really this this style on him and pick him apart. But kind of going to be game, going to be tough. He's going to have his little moments in there. He's going to be make it interesting enough, but Ain't going to be all that interesting. I feel Adesanya put him on a striking clinic and put him away in that third round. So in this fight, I have Israel Adesanya via third round TKO. And that concludes my fight predictions for the full card of fights for UFC 276, Adesanya versus Cannonier. And as always, thanks for watching.